Hi, y'all. It is Thursday, 2 16 23. I am out for a conference today, so um, I'm gonna have y'all follow along with this video to get stuff done. Please don't give this up a hard time. We are gonna have your journal work, we're gonna have um, a kind of start to your notes packet, um, a journal activity, and then an exit ticket. So you're gonna have a lot of moving parts. Try to stick with me throughout it, okay. Um, in your journals, you're going to write today's Thursday, 2 16 23, and then you're going to write down the learning objective. You can pause on this part to write it down. It says students will be able to explain the purpose and overarching process of the central dogma by breaking down vocabulary and reviewing DNA structure. I'm reviewing DNA structure with you because um, the central dogma starts with DNA and it ends with proteins. So it's a pretty important process because it's what your um, DNA was going to be used for. We talked about DNA a lot already, so I'm going to review that today with you. Um, to try to open up the thought process of why the central dogma is even important, you don't even know what it is yet, right? Um, so think about two questions for the do now. What type of vaccine was created for COVID-19? It's a unique vaccine that we haven't used before. It's not made out of antibodies and antigens from um, living vac uh, viruses or parts of viruses. It's a new kind. So if you can recall what that is and write it down. And then number two, what does it mean to be lactose intolerant? Pause and write your answers. All right. So hopefully you remembered or uh, you've heard of it before. COVID-19's vaccine is actually an mRNA vaccine. And to a lot of you, that didn't necessarily mean that much, but we're going to talk about what mRNA is during this unit and why this is such an interesting way to do a vaccine. Um, and then I feel like a lot of you know what lactose intolerance is, right? It means that you can't have milk, right? You can't have dairy. Um, and it's related to proteins in uh, your body that aren't able to break down the dairy products properly. And let's dive a little bit more into that. Um, you're not going to be able to do this part. So I am going to have you write this down in your journal underneath uh, the do now that you just wrote. And you're going to write one question that you have while or after you watch the next video on the next slide. And I'm going to be looking at these when I do your journal check. So please write a relevant question to the video. Um, there's a lot of really scientific stuff in the video. So if you're watching and you're like, miss, I don't know what any of these words are, that's okay. But try to figure out what the general context is of the, uh, explanation. Okay. So I'm gonna play the video. Make sure you write down one question, mm. um, about the video or about the topic in the video. The most common forms of sugar are glucose, fructose, and galactose. And these are all types of monosaccharides, meaning they're made up of just one sugar molecule. Molecules like this are called carbohydrates because they're made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, usually with a hydrogen-oxygen ratio of two to one. If you link two of these guys together, you get a disaccharide because di means two. And this is also a carbohydrate. Now our body uses these sugar molecules for energy, right? For us humans, glucose is our gasoline, our energy source. We'll take galactose and fructose, but ultimately we need to use glucose. So almost all the fructose and galactose we ingest is converted to glucose. And then we use that glucose for energy. All right, but usually carbohydrates aren't in the monosaccharide form when we ingest them. And a lot of what we take in are in the disaccharide form. And one notorious disaccharide that tends to cause serious gastrointestinal distress for a lot of people is lactose. Now lactose is a disaccharide that's made up of a glucose molecule and a galactose molecule. For us to use it as energy though, we have to first break it down to those two monosaccharides. In the milk of most mammals, lactose is generally the major carbohydrate. So when you have a glass of milk and it gets through your stomach, the small intestine, that lactose gets chopped into glucose and galactose by an enzyme that's fittingly called lactase. The gene responsible for the production of the lactase enzyme is expressed exclusively in the enterocytes lining the small intestine, which are cells that help absorb nutrients from the stuff we eat. Once produced, that enzyme makes its way to the cell surface, along the cell's microvilli, these little tentacles that help increase surface area and absorb nutrients. Okay, once lactose gets chopped by lactase, 
we're good to go, and we absorb the glucose and galactose and all is well. Now, as mammals, we're wired to be able to ingest milk after birth, right? So it makes sense that when we're young, we have a whole bunch of lactase enzyme, since that's pretty much all we drink. After weaning, in most mammal species, expression of the gene responsible for lactase is way down-regulated, and so production of lactase also goes way down. The majority of humans actually follow this protocol as well, and down-regulate lactase production around 3-5 to five years of age. Interestingly though, the majority of Caucasians, mainly those from Northern European background, continue having elevated lactase activity all the way into adulthood, and so they exhibit lactase persistence. Why Caucasians? Well, this group historically has domesticated cows and other milk providers and consumed lactose-based or milk-based products into adulthood. And by natural selection, it's thought that they've developed increased persistence of lactase production by specific gene mutations that are often autosomal dominant. Similar lactase persistence phenomena has been observed in separated and distinct smaller populations that rely on lactose production as well. Pretty interesting stuff, if you ask me. At any rate, what about those of us that didn't inherit the lactose persistence gene? And every time we even think about milk or dairy products, our bowels give out a small groan. Well, when that lactose gets to the brush border of your small intestine, the vast majority of it doesn't get chopped and absorbed, as much as 75%. And it just keeps on moving down the GI tract and passes into the colon. At this point, the gut flora has an absolute field day. Since microbes aren't as picky and they ferment the lactose into a mix of hydrogen gas, carbon dioxide, and methane, these gases contribute to the symptoms of gas and bloating. Along with those gases though, short-chain fatty acids are produced like acetate, butyrate, and propionate. We don't absorb these short-chain fatty acids, which means that they stay in the lumen of the gut. Both the unabsorbed lactose and products of fermentation raise the osmotic pressure which attracts water into the bowels. So water flows in and this influx of water is what leads to diarrhea. So that was a video about lactose intolerance and comparing people who are lactose intolerant to people who aren't. And it's supposed to be common to be lactose intolerant, but it's not um, just because of continual usage of dairy products throughout our lifetime, even though we shouldn't be you know, having mom's milk anymore we're having other milk um so how can a gene mutation that causes lactose intolerance cause such a big impact in your life following whatever question you wrote i want you to write at least one sentence explaining how a gene mutation that causes lactose intolerance or lactose persistence to impact daily life please include the word dna gene and protein in your sentence and underline those words so that when I grade it, I see that you used all your vocab words. You won't get full points unless you use all three. Take a pause and do that. All right, so I do wanna go over a little bit of vocab and there is a lot of vocab for this um, unit. What I'm gonna have you do is from this list, I'm gonna require that you write down two. It can be replication, enzyme, template, semi-conservative, dogma, or transcription. I would say the last two are the most important, but the top ones you should recognize. So pick two to write into your vocab box. There's another slide, so you're going to be writing two more, so don't take up the whole box. Pause and write your two down with their definition. Here's the next set. You're going to pick two more from here to write down. And again, some of these are easier. And I would hesitate to say that those first four are the most important. So I need you to pick two from here and write those down. So in total, your vocab box should have four vocab terms and four definitions attached. Pause and pick your two from here to write down. Alrighty, so kind of a review. We know that base pair sequence is important because it's the sequence or order of your nitrogen bases that determines your proteins, right? The order matters. Um, your organization of your A, T's, G's, and C's matters. And they eventually lead to the production of proteins, which are your physical body. And 
a lot of ours are similar across humans, even across all animals, even across all living things, because we all have some things that we need to just be basic cells that survive. And so those are all coded in our DNA. No DNA, no proteins. But you can have DNA even without having proteins. They just don't produce anything. And so in order to uh, make more DNA, we have to first do synthesis or replication. And we talked about this before when we were talking about the cell cycle. And I'm bringing it up again because it's really similar to one of the processes um, that we're going to talk about in the central dogma. So I might as well as show you again what this is and talk about it. And then you'll be able to see the connection between the two. We know that DNA replication is really important because um, you need a copy of DNA in every single cell. And DNA, again, is the instructions or information about what that cell is and what it does. And so all cells need these instructions. Duh. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to grow, repair, or reproduce. In your journals, you're going to set up the next whole entire page, and you're going to put a cross down the middle of your page. Um, try to make it straight up in the middle. And in the top left section, you're going to draw a nice big heart to mem uh, mark that section. In the top right corner, you're going to draw a diamond. On the bottom left, you're going to draw a smiley face. And then on the bottom right, you're going to draw a Pac-Man. And I'm going to be looking for these symbols because I'm grading each section based on the symbol topic. And I'll show you the topics as we go down. I just want you to set up the page right now. So pause and set up the page like this picture I have right here in the bottom corner. The first section that we're going to do is the smiley face. Yeah, we're not going top to bottom. We're just going in a random section. So the first thing I want you to do is to write a short CER. And this means it's a claim evidence response. I'm actually giving you the evidence, though, and you're going to make a claim and explain why you're reasoning um, based on this evidence. So the phrase I'm going to have you write for your claim is the most crucial part of the cell cycle is blah, -de blah, -de blah. And you got to pick. Your evidence that you get to choose from is G1, G, uh, S, G2, and M. And uh, remember, G1 is cell growth and normal function. S is DNA synthesis. G2 is continued cell growth and organelle duplication. And then M is nuclear and cellular division. You're going to pick one or two of these pieces of evidence to pick which part is the most crucial or most important in the cell cycle. And then you're going to explain because um, to back up your claim. I say at a minimum, this is going to be two sentences. There's no max, but it does have to fit inside of that box. Okay. Take a pause, write that down, and I'll be very clear with you. There's no correct answer. There's no wrong answer. It just depends on how you explain your reasoning. Okay. Now, based on that information, I want to emphasize for those of you who pick S phase that we're talking about synthesis. It doesn't mean it's necessarily the most important, but we're talking about it right now. So again, S stands for synthesis, and synthesis is just replication, copying, or duplication. And this happens sandwiched between G1 and G2, which are growth phases. During DNA replication, DNA makes a copy of itself to prepare for cell division. And to do that, your DNA double helix does have to be unzipped and opened so it's accessible. And these template strands are going to be used to build the new strands. And we know how to do that because we know apples grow on trees, A's go with T, and cars go in garages, so C's go with G's. So if you see a C, you're going to put a G. If you see a T, you're going to put an A. The enzymes, like DNA polymerase, do exactly that. After the DNA is unzipped and opened, DNA polymerase comes in and builds the new strands based on what's already there. And because there were two original halves, and you build the halves based on those halves, two halves on each side become two brand new strands. DNA polymerase also proofreads the work that it does. You all know what proofreading is. Go ahead and define it for me in the heart section of your page. And uh, the hint is you do this in English class, especially with essays. DNA proofreads the new DNA molecule errors um, to make sure they catch them and fix them before you go on to use that DNA as instructions for the new cell. And so uh, it's a pretty important job because DNA polymerase will make mistakes, but as long as it catches it, you don't have any crazy mutations happening. Obviously, it won't always catch it, but ideally it will. 
And then DNA ligase will glue everything together into the new strains of DNA. So they're not just falling apart because they're made up of all these little pieces. And by the end, you have um, two new double helices. You can see in this picture right here, we started with one at the top and they've been split apart and the new ones have been built based on the old ones. And then we'll end up with two separate ones. And uh, it's a semi-conservative process. I talked about this before, where if you look at this picture, the original DNA molecule is blue and we built the new parts in with yellow. But when you look at the two strands, they're not really fully new or fully old. They're about 50%, 50%. So uh, DNA is called semi-conservative because semi is half and it's half conserved from the old strand and half new. So in a nutshell, you kind of have the unzipping, the new nucleotides, checking them, gluing them, and you get two new strands of DNA to go into each cell. This process we've talked about and we've practiced before. And so now we're going to kind of shift gears and talk about protein synthesis using this DNA. The DNA is the instructions or the blueprint, but you don't have anything physical yet until you make the proteins from these instructions. That's simply called protein synthesis. We've said synthesis before. Remember photosynthesis means the synthesizing using light or making stuff using light. We've talked about um, DNA synthesis, which is making DNA. So here, when we say protein synthesis, it's making proteins. Pretty straightforward, right? This is the central dogma. Take a pause and write this down in the exact same organizer that you have on your page. Um, you have DNA. Transcription happens, turning it into mRNA. Ooh, another mention of mRNA. And then you translate mRNA into proteins. These pictures of dogs are just cute. They don't actually mean anything. Um, but I do need you to fill out your organizer for these few terms. So take a pause. As you can see, our first step is starting with DNA. And I said, that's the instructions. Obviously, instructions are just like paperwork, though. There's nothing actually made yet. It just has a bunch of like words, like how DNA is a bunch of letters. mRNA is also a bunch of letters. It's just... M stands for messenger, so it can go somewhere else because the DNA is stuck in the nucleus. It ain't going nowhere. And then you translate it into the protein language where you get the actual physical embodiment of what you were instructed to make. And so your body can, you know, use this. Can't use the information unless there's a physical thing made out of it. If you're not exactly sure, I would look this term up. I took a joking take on it um on the last slide and i put dogs for dogma haha but it doesn't actually have anything to do with dogs so go ahead and look this term up so that you have a definition but you're going to write down dogma in the diamond section on your journal page right now oh because you didn't realize the organizer was on your notes not in your journal page from the last slide that's my bad and we're going to compare dna versus rna here dna the long word. Deoxyribonucleic acid. We've talked about this before. The D comes from the deoxyribo, the N comes from nucleic, and the A comes from acid. RNA is actually shorter than DNA. It stands for ribonucleic acid, which if you realize is just part of the DNA term. It's this section right here. So they're qu quite closely related to each other. Um, their structure is a little bit different, but we're going to get into those details when we talk about transcription. We know that DNA is a double helix, right? D for DNA, D for double helix. If it's double helix, that means there are going to be two strands. But RNA doesn't say double, doesn't have a D. Therefore, it's only going to be one strand at a time. Now, here's the biggest difference I'm going to make for you as well. DNA is, um, we know we have apples, we have trees, we have garages, we have cars. For RNA, one of these has changed. We still have apples. We don't have trees. We have a U instead for uracil. But we still have cars and garages. And I'm actually going to have you... Uh, Write out the full word for that one just because it's a new word. So it's uracil, and we represent it with the capital U. The location of the DNA is the reason why we need RNA in the first place because DNA is stuck in the nucleus. And it's stuck in there for a good reason. It needs to be protected. You don't want to mess up that master copy of your information and instructions. So in the nucleus, it stays. 
the RNA can be anywhere. You'll find it in the nucleus when it's being made. You'll find it in the cytoplasm when it's out doing its job. It's a bunch of good stuff. Um, there's different kinds of RNA, so it's found in a lot of places, but it kind of encompasses like the whole cell if you say nucleus and cytoplasm. Um, and the key point is that the RNA doesn't have to only be in the nucleus like the DNA is. It can leave. So some quick checks. Should be pretty easy. You should be able to fill out these answers on your page. Where is DNA located? Where are proteins made? Right. I gave you a hint earlier that the RNA has to leave the nucleus after it's made. Where is it going? Where is that other location? The third question says, why can't DNA go directly to the ribosomes and give instructions? The ribosomes are in the cytoplasm. The proteins are being built in the cytoplasm. So why can't the DNA directly go out there? I've mentioned it multiple times at this point. Let's see if you can remember. And uh, the last question says, what has to happen in order for the information in DNA to be taken to the ribosomes? Take a look at that organizer that we wrote earlier with the central dogma. You're starting with DNA, and then what are the processes that have to happen to get all the way over to the proteins being made at the ribosomes? Just put that in a sentence for me. So like I've been saying, the instructions for making proteins are in DNA, but DNA can't leave the nucleus. Okay, so then how do we get those instructions to our ribosomes, which are our protein factories? You have a factory outside, but they don't know what to do. You have the information, but that's locked up in a room like the nucleus. So how do we actually make the proteins? Well, DNA is going to create a messenger um, or mRNA, the M in mRNA stands for messenger. And there's two steps to this process. You have to make that messenger first from the DNA using a process called transcription. And then you're going to take that mRNA out of the nucleus. It's going to flow all the way to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, just floating around in the rest of the cell. And then at those ribosomes, they're going to do a process of translation from that message to then tell the protein or tell you what you're going to be making for that protein. It's kind of like instead of you directly going to somebody and telling them what you want, you're sending a text message. The mRNA is like that text. It expresses what you want, but you didn't have to leave where you were to tell somebody what you wanted. Make sense? So as an overview, you would have DNA. And to make more DNA, you just use DNA polymerase. Okay. But when you're making RNA or mRNA from DNA, you transcribe it. It's not replication anymore. And this RNA polymerase, notice it's still called a polymerase because that's just what the they're called when they make nucleic acids. It's actually called an RNA polymerase because, wow, you guessed it, it makes RNA. After that, in the cytoplasm, you're going to translate it. And the reason it's translation is because DNA, nucleic acid, RNA, nucleic acid. This one right here, you didn't change the language. Still same kind of language. But when you change it to proteins or amino acids, amino acids are no longer the same thing as nucleic acids. So you're translating it to another language. And you do that at the ribosome in the cytoplasm. Where is it happening? DNA is in the nucleus. Transcription has to happen in the nucleus because the DNA can't leave. But once the mRNA is made, it goes to the cytoplasm. And then translation happens in the cytoplasm to make proteins in the rest of the cell in the cytoplasm. Okay. Like I said, transcription, nucleus. Translation, cytoplasm. And as you can see in this picture, translation is quite a complicated process. So when we get into it next week, it'll be interesting to talk about. But it's pretty straightforward to do as long as you get the steps right. Okay. And the end product is proteins. You're just trying to make proteins. No proteins, no body, right? So proteins are really important. Just having the DNA and just having the instructions is not enough for you to exist. You need proteins. And that's why this process is so important for all cells, all the time, for all organisms. The last section on your journal page that we haven't yet done is the Pac-Man section. And I'm going to have you do another CER. I want you to make a claim. Is DNA significant to the cell cycle, which was like mitosis, meiosis? What about to protein synthesis, which is today's stuff? I have some statements and evidence for you that you can use to back up your claim if it's significant or not. Um, for the evidence, DNA provides the blueprint for cellular instructions and processes in all cells. Every cell requires DNA. DNA is isolated in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. And proteins can only be made in the cytoplasm on ribosomes. So you're going to use 
bits and pieces of this evidence as your reasoning after the because. You're going to say, I think this because after your claim and use the evidence in your because section to support why you decided if DNA was significant or not to the cell cycle and to protein synthesis. Pause and go ahead and do the CER. All right. We're not going to actually do... Um, a standalone independent practice because that's what your journal section was. But you can close the journal now. I will be collecting it on Friday so that I can do a journal check and make sure that all that section is good. There's a reteach topic on tropisms. We talked about this a while ago. I know it's kind of like uh, out of left field, but it's not that hard, right? Remember, positive means you like it, so you go towards it for plants. And negative is you don't like it, so plants will turn away from that stimulus. And these tropisms are influenced by auxins, which are just plant hormones. Right? We have hormones. We have like adrenaline. We have estrogen, testosterone. Plants, they're just generally called auxins. And when there's a lot of auxins in an area, it grows. When there's not a lot of auxins, it doesn't grow in that specific spot of the plant. Okay. If we look at phototropism, we should be able to figure out if that's positive or negative because phototropism means light. And we know plants turn towards light. So think to yourself, is that positive or negative? Duh, it's positive. They like light, so they're going to go towards it. The next one we have is gravitropism or geotropism. Both are correct. The green parts of plants are generally negative to geotropism because they're going against gravity. The roots are generally positive because they go with gravity. And when I say with or against, I mean the direction of gravity. And we know technically the direction of gravity is down. Thigmotropism. Positive or negative? Thigmotropism is generally positive. Plants will grow towards contact to stay touching a surface that's supportive so they can climb higher and higher and higher. This is a permanent change though. So like that vine that I was talking about, once it's curled up around a stick, if you take away that stick, that vine is still curly. It just isn't able to support itself. So that's permanent. That's in contrast with nastic movement, which is repeatable and reversible. And that's plants responding to touch. Nastic movement, is that positive or negative? This one's a little iffy because for Venus fly traps, when the fly touches the plant, the plant knows to close and catch. So uh, in that case, it would be positive, right? But for the mimosa plant that we talked about in that video where you touched it and it closed all its leaves, it was negative because it wasn't trying to get damaged um, and not be able to do photosynthesis from too much damage, right? So for some plants, it's positive. For some plants, it's negative. It just depends for case to case. And that's how you know it's a movement and not a tropism. So here's our pictures that represent uh, phototropism, thigmotropism, gravitropism or geotropism, and the mimosa pudica plant that we talked about for the negative nastic movement. You're going to do your exit ticket that your um, sub will pass out to you for the last bit of class. And then that's all you have. Just make sure that exit ticket is turned in so that I can grade it for you when I'm back. And uh, good work. Thanks for sticking with me through this whole thing. I hope you have a good rest of your day.